Well, good evening. And uh, it seemed like uh, five minutes ago that we were standing here uh, on uh, uh, Wednesday morning to start the festival, and now we're here uh, for the closing event. Um, and I wonder where we're going to go. Uh, and I don't mean where the gala dinner is or uh, where we're going to be for next year's festival. No, what I want to think we're going to touch on this evening is how we can use what we've heard and seen at WAF this year as a platform for looking to the future, for using architecture as a way of fulfilling obligations and unlocking opportunities, both personal and collective. Now, if you've found the festival as stimulating as I have, there have been a series of strong projects and great talks from the WAF Futures programme on the Festival Hall stage to thought-provoking commentary delivered from this platform. And uh, you will be, as I am, quite fired up. And our final keynote speaker, Anna Pinto de Silva, will, I think, give us food for thought that will uh, help draw together many diverse threads that we may have picked up over the last three days and, and uh, give us stimulation to help to tie them together. She brings extremely diverse experience to bear. As an architect who has conceived physical and digital spaces, worked with many different types of organisation from digital giants like Amazon to housing providers and in education, as she is now a programme director at the University of Washington in uh, Seattle. This has given her a number of insights into the challenges facing the practice of architecture, which go much deeper than how to make a building watertight or where to obtain professional indemnity insurance. These insights, I think, are about the structure of society, the operation of the economy, and the way human beings relate to each other and their environment, both real and virtual environment. She is going to pose a series of questions, some of which will challenge us, because they will invite us to think about how these processes originate in historical decisions and events that would appall us if they happened now, but whose legacy runs through to how we work, how we live, and how we relate to each other. Ultimately, though, I think Anna is going to show how architecture can provide the mechanism for dreaming the future, but bringing forward a different dream to those we have dreamt up until now. Anna. Jeremy, thank you so much for your lovely introduction. It is beyond meaningful to be here with all of you this evening in celebration of this remarkable festival. The past three days have been exceptional. After a COVID-induced hiatus, the power of togetherness has been on vivid display, our dreams and visions illuminating a night sky brilliant with shared possibility. Now, festivals don't just organize themselves. They are the result of the vision, determination, and hard work of an army of remarkable people who have collaborated tirelessly for the better part of three years to bring this festival to life. And so, to Tracy Collins, Paul Finch, Jeremy Melvin, Emma Tungett, Emily Hockton, Lisa Durante, Sophie Fresley, James Hyder, and each and every one member of the extraordinary World Architecture Festival team, we salute you. You have given us the gift of global community, and for that, we are endlessly grateful. Thank you. Yes. Our mission across the arc of the past three days has been simple, to inspire each other, to challenge assumptions, honoring the theme of the festival, to come together as a global community of practice, to advance the conversation about what design can contribute to the world's future. Since the launch of the festival on Wednesday, we have seen extraordinary work, we have heard talks from some of the most important thought leaders in the field of design, and most crucially, we have celebrated the power of togetherness, engaging, connecting, and inspiring each other through vivid conversations, spirited debate, and robust camaraderie. This year's festival could not have come at a more consequential moment in our human story. The accelerating destruction brought forth by a rapidly warming planet, the ongoing impact of COVID, intensifying geopolitical conflicts and technologically amplified challenges to freedom and democracy are rewriting our lives, reshaping access to health, safety, opportunity in real time. 
The consequences of these conspiring forces are visceral and visible, with poor and marginalized communities the world over bearing the disproportionate costs, underscoring the fundamental asymmetry of innovation and its selective beneficiaries. These challenges demand a reckoning. They invite us to take a moment to reassess our accomplishments as a design community, shining a light on what we have achieved, but also making plain what we have missed and who we have failed to serve. Moments have power. According to Merriam-Webster, the word moment integrates three conspiring forces, duration, import, and movement. And I would offer one more, agency. Our force and effectiveness are predicated on how we are and where we find ourselves, not just as professionals, but simply as people circumnavigating the sun together, held within the often complex embrace of, diverse, of the diverse communities we belong to, doing the best we can to make sense of the gift that is our time on this magnificent planet. While our circumstances may differ, the pandemic has bound us, forcing a reflective stillness upon us while accelerating long-standing trends with a whiplash akin to a car wreck. As we emerge from a thousand days of COVID, this much is clear. None of us have escaped unscathed. We are all damaged goods. And yet, like all survivors, we are the holders of an imperfect grace, broken yet transformed, more certain in our deepest hearts that we matter to each other now more than ever. How will we, from this place of fragmented yet generative transformation, rise to meet the challenges before us as we work to, to redefine the arc of possibility across the remaining century? In order to chart the future forward, we must take measure. We must take care. Designers are uniquely positioned to deliver transformative change through our ability to listen, to question, to synthesize, and above all, to care. We can make a difference, but only if we understand the dynamic framework of the world around us. Mudam-se os tempos, mudam-se as vontades, mudam-se o ser, mudam-se a confiança. Todo o mundo é composto de mudança, tomando sempre novas qualidades. Said Luís de Vaz de Camões, 15th, 16th century epic poet of Portugal. Times change as do our wills. What we are is ever-changing. All the world is made of change and forever attaining new qualities. In this moment of accelerated global inflection, what will be the scope of our challenge? What will be the circumference of our courage? How large will we draw our circle of care? Our answers to these questions will help, cho will help shape the choices we make today, redefining the arc of possible for generations to come. As we launch forth from this festival to our homes and communities around the world, I offer these remarks as a love story to the power of design, to the power of care, and above all, to the power of community and the potential to innovate with difference as we work together towards the delivery of a more resilient, more equitable, and more joyous world. The worlds of design and technology are colliding with ever-increasing force, transforming our lives in real time. Our lived experience is increasingly shaped by the intersection of computational and physical worlds, redefining what it means to be a human at this moment of unprecedented inflection. In order to fully apprehend the impact technology ex is exerting on our current moment and to understand this transformative impact on our lived experience, baselining first principles is essential. Since I am first and foremost a designer, I will start with a brief consideration of design. The silent job of design has always compelled me. For me, it is this. 
to impart a sense of profound orientation and connection to the people who receive our work. One that says, we care about you. We thought about you. You are understood. You are here. We are here. Let's be together for a bit on this bench, opening this book, walking through this park, opening this door, looking across this landscape, engaging this interface, this screen. Essentially, design is an act of love, a big, giant love letter to the intersection of form, function, and meaning. The language of design is complex, framing a moment, an action, a landscape, and transforming the mundane into the meaningful, combining a scintillating, intoxicating mix of use and beauty. Design exists within an ecosystem irrigated by the intense creativity of others. Design marks the cleaving point between art, technology, business, and science. It is a fundamentally humanistic endeavor. Ultimately, design shapes action and at its best serves as a cultural change agent, celebrating the arc of human potential. Good design, clar design clarifies and explains Excellent design transcends. The task of design is to imagine the future being both parent and midwife to ideas and visions large and small. Designers help frame lenses through which we understand and communicate who we are and how we relate to each other and our world as individuals, as tribes, and as communities. As interactive design leaps from the screen into physical devices of every kind, embracing a transdisciplinary approach to design is essential. Though all design disciplines are united by an overarching set of imperatives and precepts, each design discipline is informed by a unique set of conditions, problems, scales, materials, and artifact durations. Urban designers look at the world in acres and hectares, openly embracing centuries as they imagine cityscapes, campuses, and public space. Architects design residences, buildings, museums, and skyscrapers, seeking to counter the inherent groundedness of their materials with forms that soar, float, and surprise. Industrial designers design to the micromillimeter on objects whose use varies from the disposable to the inheritance worthy. UX designers frame engagement at the intersection of the digital and physical, creating interfaces across scales and dimensions that come to life with a touch and are propelled in a very real sense by the trajectory and heartbeat of our lives. An interface literally means the space between two faces, the space between ourselves and the other. A stranger, a friend, a feeling, a place, a set of knowledge, framing the ways in which we connect to each other, to our world, to our past, and to our future. When we look at this definition at its most base level, then we can understand that interface design is carried out by all design disciplines, buildings, Landscapes, objects, experiences, and stories are all interfaces of a kind, shaping the quality of our connectedness. Computational technologies are arguably the central transformative agents of our time. They have not only created fundamentally new tools and methods for us as designers, they are opening new pathways for inquiry, analysis, and creativity in the sciences, engineering, art, and business with the potential to remap almost every aspect of our lives. How we imagine, create, model, market, and manufacture have been profoundly altered by computation. One need look no further than the smartphone in our pockets to see its vast implications as exemplified by a device only marginally bigger than a credit card. If we arrived in a lift, posted a picture of breakfast on Instagram, took an early morning jog on the Teju using an Apple Watch for pacing before heading into the festival, or wondered aloud to our partners about Twitter and the hot mess that is the public square of discourse on social media, we know viscerally what an impact technology has had on us as individuals and more broadly on our civic and community life. 
It is easy to get lost in the buzzwords of tech. Big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, VR, robotics, IoT, blockchain, neural networks, quantum computing, all crowd the headlines. It's hard not to get punch drunk on the king's ransom of possibilities these technologies contain. Key advances in genomics, biology, agriculture, health, medicine, education, and almost every branch of basic research are being unleashed by the power of compute, opening entirely new landscapes of, of opportunity to productively shape our lives. But what of technology? What is technology exactly? What do we mean when we say digital? What is meant by virtual? What landscapes of possibility do these terms contain? Far from being an, ob an objective abstraction of ones and zeros, technology has been profoundly human since the beginning, centered in creativity and the manifestation of imagined worlds and ideas. It is a story of survival and transformation, of love and power, wonder and magic, defense and, it and exploration, propelled by the need for human connection and the sheer force of human creativity. Technology is inseparable from the story of humankind, merging the Greek techne with logos. Techne means the art, skill, craft, or the way, manner, or means by which a thing is gained. Techne aims its powerful gaze on making. When twined with logos or place, technology literally means the citing of the arts, the citing of practical methods as a means of transformation and meaning making. Technology, therefore, is simultaneously a process, an object, a body of knowledge, as well as a set of methodologies contextualized within a landscape of shared possibility. One can think of Hephaestus as the first proto-technologist. The son of Zeus and Hera, Hephaestus was married to the beautiful Aphrodite and was responsible for creating the magnificent armaments of the Olympian gods. Hermes' winged helmet, the Aegis breastplate, Aphrodite's girdle, Achilles' armor, Helios' chariot, Eros' bow and arrows are all manifestations of Hephaestus' imagination and skill. To help him in his work, Hephaestus built a flock of silver automatons, robots, including a tripod that walked to and fro from his workshop to Mount Olympus. The fire stolen by Prometheus and given to man came from Hephaestus' forge, and it was Hephaestus who created Pandora and her box as a gift from the gods to man, forever setting the stage the complex role technology has played across the arc of human history. So what exactly is it that makes humans human? Understood from a purely scientific frame, Homo sapiens sapiens are characterized by an erect posture, bipedal locomotion, high manual dexterity, and heavy tool use as compared to other animals with larger and more complex brains and societies. So what does this mean? It means that we stand tall, we walk, we move, we work beautifully with our hands, we make tools that give full expression to our superpowers. We are smart, we are complicated, we build community while at the same time seeking solitude. And above all, we are curious. We are so curious, even paradise cannot hold us. With one bite of the apple, Eve shattered through this first Eden, a truly garden of wonder and delight. Establishing an exquisite trajectory, this first in a long line of adventuresses took a tiny bite from the apple of knowledge and the original paradise, the first sphere of known experience, fell away, setting in motion a pattern followed by generations of her children, characterized forevermore by an insatiable curiosity, a seeking, a wonder, a lust for what lies beyond. Ever since that original rupture, we as a human race have been guided by the intoxicating power of inquiry, creating new models and new spheres of knowledge only to upend and break them. 
relentlessly developing new technologies and new art forms, allowing us to peer beyond the safe confines of the known. We create spheres of wonder. We center ourselves within their apparent comfort. Then we shatter them in our relentless quest for knowledge. Knowledge has always been embodied. It is first acquired through the direct experience of the world, through the combined inputs of our conspiring senses, not just sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, but the other senses, thermoception, proprioception, equilibriception, just to name a few. Children are the most beautiful example of this. No matter the tumbles, the scrapes, the ouchies, they engage to learn, they taste, they touch, they smell, they feel, and they point. Fingers, digits, are our first magic wands, allowing us to experience and transform the world around us, bending it towards the shape of our dreams and ambitions. The senses do not operate in isolation. They conspire brilliantly to expand our known universe. To touch is to think, to hold is to see as any sibling knows. I doubt that there is not a person in this audience who has not said, no, let me see it, as they point to the thing that they can see perfectly well in front of them. For to truly see is also to truly feel. Our digits, our fingers have always framed the opening salvo from which our creativity has been liberated. First, we made tools and with tools investigated and transformed the immediate world around us, seeking to connect to the beyond. But it was through our imaginations, through the invention of stories and the memory palaces that retained and transmitted them, that our first means of time travel were, were truly developed. Fast forward several thousand years and oral language became codified, each cuneiform mark serving as a mini spaceship, escaping the powerful force field of the now towards the future of another person's present, creating new realms, new spheres of virtuality. So what exactly does virtual mean? The word virtual emerges in the late 12th century from the Latin virtu, meaning a life and conduct of particular moral excellence. By the 15th century, the word virtual had become distanced away from the notion of physically embodied character to take on the sense of abstracted projection which it still retains to this day. Virtual came to mean being something in essence or effect though not actually real or in fact. To be virtual then meant to be not quite real. Needless to say, the notion of virtual space was not invented by dot-commers in the 90s. It emerges with our coming of age as a species in the projected space of dreams and visions expressed in the imaginative space of a reader, immersed in the pages of a gripping novel, blind to the world around them as Harry slays the dragon, yet somehow still able to hear the dinner bell ringing in the background. So what do we mean when we talk about virtual space? What we are specifically referring to is electronically mediated virtual space space made possible by harnessing that great phantasmagorical life force, electricity. Imagine, just imagine, how long it took for humans to capture lightning. For the vast span of human history, we simply watched in awe or cowered in fear as the gods threw down their thunderbolts. And then, as if in an instant, with the practical acumen of that most American of Americans, Benjamin Franklin, tied a key to a kite and with a little help from Volta, Tesla, and Edison, the full power of electricity was finally ours. The same period saw another pair of remarkable transformations that continue to resonate today. First, computers stopped being people and began to be machines. And second, the farm gave way to the city as countless millions began the great migration from rural life at the edge of the frontier towards the more predictable and profitable serendipity of civic urbanity. These two trends trace two further arcs. 
First, the literal disembodying of the computer and its continued attempts at reincorporation. And second, the rupturing of the ancient human connection between a person and the wilderness, breaking one of the central relationships anchoring our humanity. Our gaze, which once pointed upwards towards the heavens or out across the horizon, dipped ever downward towards screens, mesmerizing us with their uncanny ability to command our attention. For all their vast potential, computers have, be have co become both vitally essential and also complicating. They connect and they divide. They simultaneously support and destabilize. Enter time. Our modern experience of time is deeply technological. Before mechanization, time was almost, almost most often experienced as a circular cadence of seasons, one giving way to another, the idea of forward motion and progress deeply beside the point. The linear westernization of time is set in motion by the ancient Greeks, whose ore were the goddesses of the season, seasons, representing the natural divisions of time. As Christianity spread throughout the Middle Ages, the day was further subdivided into canonical hours, marking periods of fixed prayer that served as a proxy for spatial, spiritual, and physical control. The encroachment of linear time was further accelerated by the advent of mechanization and amplified by innovations such as the village clock, whose bells could be heard for miles across fields and valleys. And later, as Einstein's theory of relativity would make clear, the intersection of space and time collided as train tracks crisscrossed the landscape, requiring a far more synchronized codification of time. The telegraph further accelerated this process. Hotly debated arguments between nations ensued as leaders fought to determine the global locus of time, eventually and quite grudgingly deciding on the Greenwich Meridian. In the ensuing century, satellite technology further subdivided time so that now we can measure time and space with almost atomic accuracy, allowing us to know exactly and precisely when our Uber Eats driver will arrive. Given this briefest of histories, we can see that time is far from neutral. Our modern experience of time rests on a set of technologically framed agreements that are normalized through negotiation and argument and set within the confines of a specific cultural context. For example, Buddhism teaches us that time does not exist. There is only an eternal now. The Lakota tribe's story of seven generations bridges the past to the future through the fulcrum of the present. Three generations of ancestors support and guide. Three generations of descendants bear witness to our actions, helping us assess our choices, the way we raise our children, the way we treat others, the challenges we define for ourselves and communities by the impact they will have on future generations. The social determinants of health provide yet another model, helping us understand the ways in which our environment shapes not only our outcomes, but also impacts future generations, defining the arc of opportunity available to our children and their children. The long durée, a central concept developed by the brilliant historian Fernand Brodel and his colleagues at the French Annales schools, provides further context. The long durée is part of a, uh, describes a tripartite system that includes événements, short-term timescale events that are the domain of the journalist, conjoncture, medium-term periods of decades or centuries when more profound cultural changes take place, such as the Industrial Revolution or the advent of the internet. And finally, the long durée, which gives priority to long-term historical structures focusing on all but permanent, slowly moving events. When we understand time through the, the refracted light of these collective lenses, we can see that our lives are part of, a much, of much broader temporal structures. They do not start and stop with the moment of our birth or the moment of our death. The drivers that shape the contours of access that we are born into extend generations before our births, just as the impact of our lives extends far beyond our deaths. 
This is true from a cultural perspective. This is true from an economic perspective. This is true from an epigenetic perspective. We touch down today in a world predicated on technological empowerment in a place that is at once familiar and disquieting. The, the intersection of the digital and physical world, once a point of fascination and science fiction novelty, are commonplace. The intersection, a smart street lamp that just a decade ago shone brightly with the promise of urban transformation, is now seen in the slightly dimmed light of experience as we understand that sensors, obviously, have the power not only to sense, but to surveil. COVID and the Zoom pandemic that ensued during the crisis has force multiplied this acceleration. A sense of place is defined as a social phenomenon that exists independently of any one individual's perceptions or experiences, yet is dependent on human engagement for its existence. In his landmark book, Space and Place, Perspectives of Experience, Yi Fu Tuan suggests that place is security and space is freedom. We are attached to one, yet long for another. The, te the tectonic plates of human, of human placemaking have shifted as a result of the internet and social media technologies. According to Derrida, and who would argue, the fall of the Berlin Wall concluded the 20th century, and the advent of the internet gave birth to the 21st. And indeed, as we near the quarter mark of this century, technology continues to challenge our ideas about boundary, safety, and identity, transforming our experience of place, virtual, physical, and everything in between towards new realms of experience, new frontiers to be explored, developed, and exploited. Supercharged by an electrified technological current, the act of living today is predicated on the particular qualities of technologically enabled connectedness. The tools we have in our pocket serve as membranes and nodes, connecting us to those we wish to be bound to and separating us from those we wish to separate ourselves from. We have powers that even Superman would long for, and yet at the same time are aware of vulnerabilities and exposures that we'd honestly rather not think about. We recognize that yet again, we are at another beginning. The power of computation and its subsequent collision with long-standing demographic trends inform the cultural turbulence of our current moment. I offer my own story by way of example. Lisbon has been the backdrop of our convening, its romance and beauty belying the complex role played by the Portuguese as they establish the foundational infrastructures globalization relies upon to this day. As the daughter of Portuguese scientists, Lisbon has been the background of my life, America my foreground. I am Portuguese, I am American, I'm both, I'm neither. Like many of you, I live within the sometimes beautiful, sometimes isolating, always liminal space that exists between cultures and identities. The tension between these identities revealing a complex inheritance that informs my work as a designer, and more broadly, my life. Founded in 868, King Afonso Henriques by King Afonso Henriques, Portugal is the oldest country in Europe. Sitting at the westernmost edge of Iberia, Portugal faces the sea. With over a thousand miles of uninterrupted coastline, the beyond exerts a magnetic power. The romantic tension between Portugal's history and its pocket-sized geography juxtaposed against the vast expanse of ocean and star-spangled sky has pulled its people ever forward in pursuit of adventure, salvation, and opportunity, launching forth generations of knights and navigators, fortune seekers and fishermen. To be Portuguese is to leap. As a Luso-American, I am part of a Portuguese diaspora scattered the world over. From our, our shared heritage refracted through the lens of geography, time, and culture. From Boston to Brazil, Mozambique to Macau, Angola to America, I belong to a group of people whose shared identity is united by the red thread of history, connecting colonialism to culture, 
opportunity to opportunism, and salvation to slavery, bound by a sense of shared identity and global nationhood first established by the Portuguese during the Age of Discovery. Led by Prince Henry the Navigator in the early 1400s from his headquarters in Sagres, the first scientific and technological research center of its kind, the Portuguese Age of Discovery was propelled forward by the brilliance, ferocity, skill, grit, and let's say it plain, cruelty-fueled courage of navigators such as Vasco da Gama, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, and Fernand Magalhães. Through their exploits, these men and their contemporaries created the world's first network of global trade, circumnavigating the globe to connect Europe to Africa, to India, to China, and to the Americas, setting in motion a system, the system of globalization upon which our, our world still spins. However extraordinary, Prince Henry's accomplishments also brought forth a shadow innovation the dross to the gold of his remarkable achievements. Inventing du jour race-based segregation, Prince Henry established the first legal framework for modern slavery, formally codifying blackness as inferior and outside the care of the church, thereby justifying the pursuit, sale, and enslavement of black non-Christians in Africa as an essential part of the colonial economic engine igniting a global slave trade that would be amplified and expanded upon by the English, Dutch, Spanish, and Americans for centuries with continued reverberations, defining landscapes of opportunity and access that shape our lives today. National mythologies are powerful things. Growing up between cultures, tentative and unsure within both, as I struggle to, find, to define my own sense of place, Courageous stories of nationhood and adventurous becoming were comforting. These narratives providing, uh, provided a feeling of stability and cultural grounding. Over time, these stories slowly gave way, revealing a richer, more complicating narrative as I struggled to navigate the topography of my own access and privilege. First, experience as a child in Washington, D.C., and later in the brightly lit white spaces of big tech innovation. 1974, D.C. was heartbreak made visible. Nixon's resignation cast a shadow across the city, still, cr still struggling to recover from the 1968 race riots following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. D.C. felt like a moonscape. Its official core, the Mall on Washington, hung on with the institutionally propped up grace of an aging matriarch, while the neighborhoods surrounding it remained shuttered and bruised. The late architectural historian Herbert Mouchamp famously called the Washington metropolitan area the world's largest theme park, and in that sense, it did not disappoint. In 1974, Potomac had yet to sprout the crop of supersized McMansions that would become its defining hallmark, but the die had been cast. As old money gave way to new, Potomac became the epicenter of a strangely historic, a historic Achievatron culture that had no place for cultural reckonings. The past carefully curated to present an almost flawless suburban facade, an idealized version of colonial America, all made possible through a seemingly admirable system of meritocratic achievement that belied a meticulously crafted, elegant game of ruthless redlining and exclusion. But beyond the manicured lawns and the six-car garages, the past was present. Sometimes through the arrival of an itinerant farm worker who would appear as if from a different chapter in time, emerging quietly and suddenly in our garden, his black skin and weather-furrowed brow framing eyes so deep and li liquid they made time stand still. The past emerged in the soft-shouldered foothills of the Appalachian Mountains and the careworn post-Civil War landscapes we drove through in Virginia and rural Maryland, the hard scrabble land giving birth, giving birth to boulders and graveyards, poverty visible in the front porches and backyards of old houses whose original plots now cut too close to the newly made interstate. 
The past revealed itself in the faces of the kids from Scotland, the low-income housing development we were tacitly taught to avoid that was in fact the site of an historic black settlement founded by former slaves after the Civil War whose community preservation was a triumph of, collect of collaborative development, an accomplishment worthy of celebration, not shame. The past became visible during museum visits, where the only black people to be seen were those guarding rather than viewing the trove of artistic treasures we visited endlessly at the National Gallery. The Portuguese story of discoveries, of the discoveries in all its gilded swashbuckle courage and technological achievement, sat adjacent to the story of American invention and rugged exceptionalism the disquieting tether connecting these two narratives difficult to perceive among, amidst the romantic ambience of their nation-making intent. Yet tucked away beneath four centuries of accounting books and ship's logs, the flashpoint connecting these narratives struck forth when, on what was surely a murderously hot, sweltering summer day in August 1619, the first sale and subsequent purchase of enslaved Africans by early American colonists in Jamestown, Virginia, took place. Stolen by pirates aboard uh, the English ship, the White Lion, from aboard the San Juan Bautista, a Portuguese slave ship whose crew had kidnapped these men and women from what is now Angola, this moment of harrowing commercial exchange became the working draft for an economic blueprint based on labor theft and imprisonment that underpinned colonial life and the ensuing democratic projects, economies of enslavement privileged. The labor stone stolen by these 20 to 30 men and women and the 10 to 15 million enslaved people subsequently kidnapped and brought to the Americas by the Portuguese and their, contemporary colonial, their colonial contemporaries fueled the colony's economic engines, underwriting the economic output of the then emerging nation, helping subsidize American prosperity and serving as the invisible hand shaping its constitution thereby setting the stage for centuries of deeply asymmetric access to opportunity, structural inequality, and e economic disenfranchisement through redlining and other discriminatory economic practices, and fueling forward the ongoing racial violence that has haunted the American story ever since. We are always in the act of becoming. The spaces and places we have the privilege to experience shape us, remaking us anew if only we let them. My awareness of my own story and its relationship to the democratic narrative that has underpinned my life and by extension, the lives within my community of practice has been gradual. The struggle to be heard and perceived as often the only woman in the room, dimming the light of my own perception. Across the arc of my career, there has been a persistent delta between the ideators in the room and the overarching demographics of the people for whom our solutions are intended. I am ashamed to say that it took me longer than I would care to admit to see who was not in the room with me, to acknowledge the absence of black and brown innovators in the rooms and communities that I had the privilege to be part of. It is something that once you see, you cannot unsee. Because the channels of access that were narrowly open to me remain resolutely closed to so many. Seen within the larger economic framework of structural racism, centuries in the making, the avenues narrowly open to me remain almost inaccessible to hundreds of millions of people, not just in the United States, but around the world. The scale of the theft is vast. The stories we tell and the stories we don't tell matter. I have told you my story, but what of our story? What will we dream together? Taken together, our creative community represents less than 0.125% of the world's population. Despite its small size, our global innovation community punches far above its weight, shaping the experiences of billions of people across the globe. And yet, 
in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., through our scientific and technological genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make of it a brotherhood. We have tremendous access. We have remarkable privilege. Our individual and collective choices matter. Technology reflects the values of the societies in which it is deployed and can't fix problems that a society is unwilling to fix itself. As powerful as the tools are at our disposal, it is the power of culture, the power of our beliefs that create our most lasting architectures. We make what we believe. We make what we recognize. We build what we value, our values providing the bedrock of our built solutions. We must ask ourselves, who is in the room and who is missing? Who does our work privilege and who is left behind? Do we have the courage to, de to democratize and decolonize innovation, radically expanding access to the tools and economic ecosystems of invention and creativity? Can we work from the premise that every life has equal value, extending this frame to include all life, not just human life, imagining technological pathways that will deliver our planet seven generations forward to the next seven and beyond? Instead of seeking salvation from singular innovation leaders, charismatic in their glory, can we become instead a global leadership community bound by the deep belief that together we stand stronger than we do apart? Bringing this new future forward will require grit, determination, and resolve. It will require empathy. It will require care. It will require that where we have a wishbone, the backbone of our dreams is stronger still. Can we bring this future forward? Given the remarkable talent we have celebrated across this festival and contained within our global community of practice, the answer is a definitive yes. If we can dream it, we can deliver it together. Thank you. Can, can you can you hear me? It's just on now. I'm not getting any reaction. Yes, it is. Good. Anna, well, thank you very much for, for an absolutely stimulating presentation. I think it's set all sorts of things in my head, and I'm sure in everyone else's. But of, of all the things that have come to the fore, um, there's one thought I'd just like to start with, if we may, which is that um, it's a difference, I suppose, between what we experience and how we, we, how we rationalize and respond to that experience. That, you know, what you were talking about, Henry the Navigator, you know, making these incredible uh, advances in navigation um, and uh, opening up networks of trade and contact, much of which could be positive. But, but then discovering that some people had a different color of skin, maybe spoke languages that were not comprehensible, um, had different religions, the reaction to that is to limit, whereas the, the reaction to the experience of, of, the, of the world was to open up. Mm -hmm. And what this seems to be, and I think there are other examples where this was at least implied in what you said, that the first reaction is often positive. It's often about curiosity. It's often about trying to open things up. But then you get a, a, an imposition of an ideological system that, that undermines everything or almost all that's positive that could come from the initial uh, initiative. And I, I just wonder if we can tease that out a little bit more. Is this something that's inherent in the way we as humans think? Is it something to do with certain types of culture, perhaps particularly European or European-derived cultures? Or is it, is it something that happened because of, of, of a particular moment in time in the 16th, 15th, 16th centuries? That is, a, that is a very big question. I, I would say that the dark forest exists at all times. Mm. Um, and, you know, 
curiosity, when pursued, at some moment we arrive in that dark place where we don't know where we are, particularly if our curiosity is profound and big, and we have to decide what do we do next. And one of the things that's interesting about so many of the poor choices we often make as cultures, and there's no, uh, there, there's no need to call anybody out here, spin the globe, pick a culture, there's going to be issues that we would, would easily be able to talk about with equal vividness, um, is the reification of moment after moment. Mm. If we keep deciding again and again, oh, it's okay, we'll just do that thing again, mm. and we'll just do that thing again. It takes quite a bit of real courage to raise one's voice and to say, enough, we need to do something different. Mm. Standing out and standing up is a very dangerous thing to do. We tend to romanticize heroes who have done that, but we fail to recognize how incredibly difficult it is to make productive change happen. And, and also what the heroes, in inverted commas, have to do to get there, to get to that status. I mean. Uh, it, it, it strikes me also that, I, for various reasons, I've been rereading Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, which <laughs> I'm sure, as a daughter of scientists, you're well aware of. And you're talking about a sort of dark version of, I think, what he talks about. In, in, in essence, what Kuhn suggests is that science advances through a series of paradigms which take a long time to gain acceptance, a long time to be fully understood, but once they are, they become enormous agencies for radical scientific advance because they help to define the problems that we might solve. And then in defining those problems, problems with the initial paradigm come up mm -hmm. and eventually, over maybe uh, centuries, that paradigm will be replaced by another one. And almost, we're, we're, we're talking here about the, the relationship between discovery, and I, I don't want to say it's all about Prince Henry the Navigator, but obviously he, he's a, 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 a key figure, and more than just a, a, a character in your narrative. Um, it, the, the, the discovery then requires a paradigm, it, which is the reverse of what Kuhn says. For Kuhn, the paradigm is what you need before you have a discovery. Whereas with the Prince Henry, he made a discovery and then imposed a paradigm. And that paradigm was informed by a series of cultural beliefs that came from his time and place and, and class, possibly. And I think this is, this, that, that I'm interested in how we could unpick that sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the, the, the obvious answer is, um, and it's never been terribly su successful, is political and social revolution. Um, but what about things like the way the professions work? And we, we're here obviously talking about architecture. Mm. And um, one of the things about all the great professions is that they mediate um, sophisticated knowledge in a way that works, or, or the intention is, doesn't always work like this, but the intention is to that make that scientific useful for the mass of humanity. And medicine is an obvious example. Engineering is an obvious example. In architecture, it's less obvious because architecture has a more heterogeneous purpose and therefore is more susceptible to some of the things you're talking about, the, the embedding of um, you know, traditional um, uh, uh, you know, discrimination and, and, and in some cases racism. Um, and I just wonder if there's a way of using the profession, particularly architecture, that wouldn't embed some of those structures? What would we need to do with it? We, would it be simply changing the way we educate architects, the way we license architects? Or would it be through events such as this, pointing out those elements of architectural practice that do, do it already and inviting people to extend, extend and repeat them? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so thank you for that. That's a, there's a lot there. Um, a couple of things. One is um, just bringing, bringing into the conversation as one does on a Friday night, Marshall McLuhan's Tetrad, yeah. right? His Tetrad of media events, mm. which I think really complements Thomas Kuhn's um, suppositions mm. and, and mental model. The idea that once an idea is accepted into a culture, it overextends itself, right? Mm. And then breaks and then in its reimagining acquires uh, in a new, a new technology, some aspect of the thing that was disrupted previously, and it goes on in this other cycle. Mm. The other th comment to fold in there is um, thinking about Cyrano de Bergerac. I don't know if any of you guys remember how he proposes to get to the moon, 
right? He throws a stone with a little ladder and then he climbs up it and he gets to this little place and he throws another stone and then he climbs up the rope to this other place. And I think in many ways, each of our discoveries and our technologies gives us visibility towards a new, a new mountain range and that is the gift, right? Mm -hmm. But then the other thing also, and we talked about time, we talked about the long durée, the practice of architecture as a profession is an événement, brothers and sisters, mm. right? Mm. It's mm. only a hundred and something years old, right? It's not some, and even though we build big things that seem incredibly permanent, the fact is that from a historic standpoint, they are not, and the practice of architecture is not. My sense right now, as someone who lives between the digital and the physical world, twofold. Firstly, architects are not fully participating in what the new architecture could be, right? What is the intersection of the lived experience? What is the true architecture of our lives? And instead of jumping to form and saying it needs to be a building, right? It needs to be a home, it needs to be a workplace, but that doesn't always mean that the building is the sum total. If you think about the way that McKim, Mead and White began their work in the early 1900s, they designed the total experience, right? Mm -hmm. Wagner and his Gemünschte Werk did the same thing. He defined the whole total experience. Frederick Law Olmsted, when he designed the Great Chicago ex Exhibition of, what was it, 1890, designed the entire experience. And I think that there's an invitation, extremely exciting, for architects to partner with their digital, um, their digital and computational brothers and sisters to start really imagining forward, what does this new world look like? We've been given a mandate, and right now I'd love to see people really coming up with a structured, deep point of view about what that looks like. And as someone who's done a lot of future forward envisioning, I will promise you that is not an easy thing to do, but it will be immensely rewarding. And I think one of the points you made about the, the human lifespan, that it actually doesn't begin with birth and end with death, which I think is a very telling point. Um, and it seems to me that, that we can look at that in spatial terms as well, that the space we occupy is not just the liminal, you know, whatever Heidegger may have thought, um, you know, spaces that we can see and touch and feel. It's actually extended. And we all, as you say, use devices that deliberately extend that. They project ourselves into a different sort of space. And, and that space can sometimes be very awkward, it can be very uncomfortable, but it's there mm -hmm. and we can't ignore it. So I think what you're doing, what you're suggesting is that as well as extending in, in our concept of time in our human life cycle, we should extend our concept of space in terms of experience, which I think would be absolutely re remarkable. And, and in a sense, this has been going on for, for, for generations. You, know, you showed a picture of a library, I'm not sure what library it was, but it's university. Trinity. Yeah, yeah. and um, that is um, extending the concept of knowledge and some of the great early modern libraries were, you know, used architecture to project that idea that here knowledge went beyond the boundaries of the known into the unknown. Absolutely. Okay, so this is what I really am. I wasn't able to put this in my talk because there is a limit of what one talk can contain. <laughs> but I do want to share the following with everyone. It's a thought. It's just put this in your mind. Since 1970, the power of computation has risen so exponentially that if you were to apply the power of compute to a car, it would mean that you could drive from San Francisco to New York in 2.2 seconds. Okay? Yeah. So what has happened now and then, so we're going to stay on this for a second. Yeah. So here we are in the space of one generation. It's not just going from zero to 60, it's going from zero to 60 billion. We have this incredible thing called the power of computation that's creating distributed neural networks that are constantly moving and exploding in growth. We don't even know what we, we never knew what we knew to begin with and now we really don't know what we know, but it's, it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But the people who are the working in these systems are also very new at this. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, the American, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a little bit like we're drunk with our own power. We don't really understand the impact of some of the work that we do. Example, social media. 
most people, I would say, you know, raise your hand. If you could just, if everybody could just take a break off of social media for a month, would you do it? Like, oh my God, <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> we are now, if you think about this, since 2005, we are all responsible for the care and feeding of multiple virtual personas, right? In addition to the care and feeding of ourselves and our families, right? Yeah. The workload, this, in, this very subtle in, uh, incrustation of digital dust has gotten heavier and heavier and heavier on our shoulders. And there really is an invitation to reimagine what we're doing, and that's essentially what COVID has done. What COVID showed in a very accelerated way was we are tired, and we cannot live in this digital world as it is defined for very much longer because we're going to break. Yeah, I think that's a very, I'm afraid, um, a, a note to finish on. I just want to end with a slight hint of optimism, which comes from the great postmodern architect Charles Moore, who died um, almost 30 years ago, I think, if I can open my, my iPad. Um, and he wrote in an essay, um, if we, meaning architects, can lose the agonies attending our professional hang-ups, um, sorry, it's... Uh, uh, if we can lose the agonies attending our professional hangouts about revolution, relevance, ineffectiveness, hierarchy, advocacy or arrogance, divine right, racism, inefficiency, failure to reproduce, isolation and certification, we will have left in our province one of the key tools for the solution of the world, design. And I think that, you know, that, that we may disagree with the list of things that he doesn't like. Um, some of them are essential, some of them are real problems. But the idea that design is a way of thinking, because design brings together so much. Design is a way of synthesizing information. It's a way of relating otherwise incompatible ideas to each other in the hands of a great designer. And I think that that is really what we're trying to suggest architecture can be. That's what we want people to try and take away from this, from this festival. And I hope, thanks to Anna and some of the other commentators, uh, and the experience that we've offered, um, you will be able to do something of those, that sort. And if you haven't this year, come back next year, uh, which uh, it, it, we're going to announce later today where that will be. Um, and also, uh, just a quick sort of announcement, if you're going to the gala dinner, um, ask one of the WAF team where the buses are, and there's a bus, I think, at 7 o'clock and another one at 7.15, yes, Caroline's indicating that's right. Um, so that will get us to the gala dinner. Otherwise, you will be in the hands of the digital monster, Monsieur Uber, um, to get there. Um, but, uh, uh, and then if you're not coming to the gala dinner, thank you very much for coming. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, all the content on this stage will be available online, I think, from sometime next week. So if you want to catch up with something, you, you can. Um, and um, then I, early in, in the early part of next year, January, February, we'll announce the themes and the categories uh, for next year's festival. And hope to see you all back there again. So thank you very much. And can we thank Anna for a fantastic talk?